all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress' eyebrow. Then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And then, the justice, in fair round belly with good cape on lined. With eyes severe and beard of formal cut, full of wise saws and modern instances. And so, he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon. With spectacles on nose and pouch on side. His youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank and his big manly voice, turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere oblivion. Sends teeth, sends eyes, sends taste, sends everything. Well, I think most people would agree that Shakespeare is the most important and comprehensive playwright that's ever existed. Uh, the fact that he is performed in many other languages and perhaps more frequently than any other playwright throughout the world indicates that in some strange and magical way which we find quite hard to explain, he seems to uh, deal with and discuss and dramatize most of the things that matter to most human beings. There's no one quite like him in that respect. His great genius, in setting aside the genius of, of the poetic imagination, was his ability to observe people as they really are and yet not be judgmental about them. What it is to be a human being it really doesn't change very much. And that is why he is as contemporary now as he was when those plays were first seen and heard on the South Bank. How could this have been one person who not only told so much story, but the bigger point revealed absolutely the primary templates to the human condition. There is no clearer body of work that thumbprints the human archetypes or character types more clearly and more comprehensively than the work of William Shakespeare. Why, oh, I can smile. And murder while I smile, and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and frame my face to all occasions. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover, I'm determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid. Shakespeare created characters who are still alive for us today, but his own character remains an enigma. We know little about his personality from the facts of his life. Some people even doubt that Shakespeare was the author of the plays which bear his name. Others see his invisibility as a necessary condition for his expansive art. As William Hazlitt said, he was nothing in himself, but he was all that others were or that they could become. The thing about Shakespeare that's always so puzzling is the absence of ego. He wrote himself out of history. There's so little documentation. There's more than people think, but there's still not enough about his education and about all kinds of things, about who the sonnets are addressed to and so forth. It's almost as if he walked along like a red Indian, you know, brushing out his footsteps as he went. It's impossible to pin him down about what he thinks. And, and as you work with Shakespeare, actually finding the man, trying to find um, what his opinions were about almost anything is very difficult. But along the way, it's a cliche, uh, you nevertheless find out quite a lot about who you are.
the mystery is added to by the fact that we know so little about him that uh, we don't really know the details of his personal life in, in as much detail as we know other playwrights. And it's almost as if this stuff has arrived on Earth from some other omniscient planet. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. <laughs> How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is to do? A deed without your name. Toad that on the cold stone, days and nights are 31. Sweltered venom, sleeping got. Boil thou first in the charmed pot. I of Newton, toe of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Adder's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing. No salt the Elizabethan period is an amazing time of transition. It's where, as it were, all the forces of the first half of the millennium and those of the second half come together. And out of the creative clash between old ideas and new comes genius. So Shakespeare, he's at the crossroads of medieval Catholicism, modern Protestantism, of feudalism and individualism, of an old idea of rootedness, and a, a set of sort of country ideals and a new idea of the cosmopolitan. And so there is a sense in which the, the, the extraordinary energy of the plays is generated by the complexity of the historical moment. What we do know about Shakespeare is that he was born in Stratford-upon-Avon in 1564, the son of a glove maker and town alderman. Shakespeare almost certainly attended the King Edward VI Grammar School, where he would have studied for 12 hours a day, six days a week. Here he would have been exposed to the classics, in particular the fables of Ovid and the revenge tragedies of Seneca. He would also have been schooled in the art of rhetoric, something which would later inform his ability to dramatize conflicting points of view. Shakespeare's grammar school education gave him an incredible founding in the art of arranging language for persuasive effect. It was in the grammar school that he began to encounter Ovid, who, who influenced his ideas of myth and of transformation so much. But in the grammar school, they also had this, these rhetorical exercises where you had to learn to use language persuasively to argue both points of view, rather as when a lawyer is trained, they would have to argue both the defence and the prosecution. And that's an art that Shakespeare took over into his plays. And it leads to this effect of always giving you both sides and never making up your mind one way or the other. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands? Organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions. Fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons. Subject to the same diseases healed by the same means, warmed and cooled by the same winter and summer as a Christian is. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? At some point during the 1580s, either to escape an unhappy marriage or seek his fortune in the capital, Shakespeare moved to London to pursue a career as an actor and playwright. The London theatre at the time was really pretty rackety. I mean, the area where it was outside the city boundaries, either out Stoke Newington, Newington Butts, or on the south bank of the Thames, uh, was full of brothels, bear pits. Uh, it was where the seamier side of life went on. Actors were rogues and vagabonds. Being an actor, being a playwright was not a particularly respectable activity. But it would have been wonderfully colorful, wonderfully garish. It would have been rats everywhere, full of disease. For 20 miles away, you could smell London. So bad was the hygiene. London was uh, an almost oriental city in its babel of tongues full of immigrants. When he first arrived in London, Shakespeare was up against uh, a group of playwrights, Green, Peel, Lilly, Marlowe, all educated university men. 
Follow that boat. Watch your arc up now. I know your face. Are you an actor? Yes. Yes, I think I've seen you in something. That one about King. Really? I had that Christopher Marlowe in my boat once. And the theatres, of course, were regarded as great breeders of disease, so every so often the plague would sweep in and the theatres would be closed down by the authorities. It was a very sensual area of London, Bankside, right next to the Thames here. Around the top gallery of the theatre, there would have been many um, prostitutes who worked in this area in the Liberty of the Clink. So one of the things that when you came in the theatre, you, you, you might have come not for the play at all, but to meet someone rather beautiful and make an arrangement with them. And this structure, or something like this structure, is the first building after the Roman amphitheatres in this country, built for the purpose of telling theatre. It's partly based on, on bull and bear baiting rings, very, very, very brutal uh, affairs where, where a bull would be baited by 50 or 100 dogs. And it's into that um, very sensual and wild, uh, earthy kind of uh, environment that Shakespeare makes a particular effort to put his plays. One of Shakespeare's earliest plays, Titus Andronicus, is a bloody revenge drama set in ancient Rome. The play exploits the Elizabethan appetite for violence. It's littered with corpses and ends with Titus serving up his enemy's children in a pie. In Shakespeare's day, people would go to public executions as entertainment. So any playwright had to do something better than that to entertain the masses. And clearly, Titus is a play about violence and about violence as entertainment. It's both. It's about making you feel what it is to be part of a violent culture. It's about the victims. It's not just about the action. Yet, I think he plays with the fact that as a people, human beings, I mean, we love violence. We are obsessed with sex and violence as entertainment. Cometh Andronicus, bound with laurel boughs, to re-salute his country with his tears. Stand gracious to the rights that we intend. Romans, of five and twenty valiant sons, behold the poor remains, alive and dead. He is the leader of a country, and he ends up being, like Hannibal Lecter, a psychopathic madman killer. And the spiral that takes Titus from a good, solid leader to a demonic butcher who bakes people into pies and feeds them to their mother is an astounding arc. Welcome, my gracious lord. Welcome, dread queen. Welcome, me warlike goths. Welcome, Lucius. And welcome all. <laughs> Although the cheer be poor, it will fill your stomachs. Please, you eat of it. The Elizabethans were fascinated by ancient Rome as the prototypical empire. What happens in Titus Andronicus is that Shakespeare breaks down the, the model of Rome as the place of civilization and elsewhere as the place of barbarism. <laughs> He also breaks down the barriers between tragedy and comedy. Titus Andronicus is his darkest, most violent tragedy, but it's also a play that succeeds in being comic about the terrible. This juxtaposition of opposites is very true to the sensibility of our time. We're used to movies which move from cannibalism or mutilation one moment to dark comedy the next. That appeals to the iconoclasm of the modern sensibility. But Shakespeare got there first in Titus. In plays like Titus Andronicus, Shakespeare was writing for the popular commercial theatre. But he was also reworking dramatic conventions and extending the range of what theatre could do. 
What Shakespeare did for the stage was develop from the rather one-dimensional vice v virtue tradition of the medieval morality plays, every man and so on, suddenly began to turn these people into three-dimensional people who were real figures who still are alive for us today. I think the theatre had a double function in Elizabethan society. It was sheer entertainment for the groundlings, the people who paid a penny to go and stand in the sawdust pit in the middle. And then the upper tiers would be full of classically educated toffs who paid sixpence to go, and it was quite a respectable activity. And as his work progresses, you can see that Shakespeare is consciously writing for both audiences. The Globe Theatre was absolutely the television of its time, no question. Everyone from the street sweeper to the Queen of England would turn it on, you know, go in. And you'd have people having fights in the mud, you know, in the, in the pit. And in the gods, there'd be kind of, you know, um, Judy Dench secretly watching Shakespeare in Love, you know. These two pillars are called the Pillars of Hercules. In Greek temples, they were like a gateway um, that, that uh, you pass through, a bit like Ulysses passing through Scylla and Charybdis. Th this is an old way of initiating people into the mysteries of life, into the enigma of life. And Hercules or Atlas pries apart the heavens and the earth so that you can see that space between where we live, where people live, between, between those, those, those forces in themselves. And I suppose when you feel when you stand on the stage here between these pillars that we're, we're coaxing the audience's imagination towards a mystery. Shakespeare's prologue in Henry V comes forward and invites the audience to fill out the scene with their imagination. This is not because, as it were, he is longing for television and film to come along and do the job which otherwise language would have to do. It's because the play is made out of language. That is what we are invited to take pleasure in. of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword and fire crouch for employment. The theatre is a metaphor for life, as a mirror for life, is something that he um, plays with all the time. And, uh, and he presents people, often uh, revealing um, sides of themselves to certain people and not to others, that underlines the idea that we are, we are many, many different kinds of uh, individual. And the plays attack that complexity. Canst thou, when thou commandst the beggar's knee, command the health of it? No, thou proud dream that placed so subtly with a king's repose. I am a king that find thee, and I know tis not the orb and scepter, crown imperial, the throne he sits on, nor the tide of pomp that beats upon the high shore of this world. Not all these, laid in bed majestical, can sleep so soundly as the wretched slave. Theatre is fundamentally subversive because of this insistence that roles are just roles and that anybody can step into anybody else's shoes. Kingship is not an, an inherent, inborn, real quality. It's a sandwich board that an ordinary man puts on that says, I am royal. And everyone goes, OK, you're royal. We'll play that game. Once more, unto the breach. Dear friends, once more, or close them all up with our English dead. Once you move from a world of rigid status in which social arrangements were seen as sort of uh, representations of cosmic arrangements 
and you start to see them as voluntary undertakings between individuals exercising their will, then everything is uh, thrown up in the air. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, training upon the starts. The game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry! England and St. George! Shakespeare was writing at a time of great political and cultural expansion. The English language, once a disregarded dialect, was being reinvented with new vigour as Elizabethan England played an increasingly important part on the world stage. Spelling and grammar were fluid. English had no dictionary until 1604. Thousands of new words were being coined and Shakespeare was in the forefront of this linguistic explosion. He was writing for a time where that language was absolutely contemporaneous. No one would have had any difficulty in understanding that, nor would they have had any problem with the, with the energy, with the vigour, with the, the kind of muscular strength that there is in that language. It was an inordinately energetic time. Where he is unbelievable, un inconceivably a, a, a beam of white pure light, and has never been matched in my view, is the ability to reveal the human condition character through an unbelievable use of language. Unbelievable. The man invented one quarter of the English language. You know, a word like um, bubble, you know, do you want your mineral water with bubbles? He just made up. He made up that word bubble, you know? So his uh, ability to take language, use it like clay, bend it, twist it, you know, slap it around and then introduce new elements to it was just unsurpassed. Shakespeare's vocabulary, for instance, there are 20,000 different words used in Shakespeare's plays. There are 6,000 different words used in all of Milton's work. The average vocabulary of the average Oxbridge graduate of today is 3,000 words. You've got a, a line like, um, show me the money, you know, from Jerry Maguire, um, make my day, or, or, you know, there are these, there are occasionally these lines that just pop out of, of, uh, out of a film or a theatrical production that resonate for people, that become the words that, that say something. There's very few in modern movies that compare with the amount of sayings that you can get out of Shakespeare. You know, we, people aren't even aware of how much of their language comes from, from Shakespeare plays. He's just created concrete images of things that are inexpressible. Shakespeare's linguistic fertility also produced the 154 sonnets which he composed between 1593 and 1600. They combine psychological subtlety, showmanship, and deep ambiguity. The extraordinary thing about the sonnets is they could have been written by a person of either sex, and they could be written about a lover of the opposite sex or the same sex. It really doesn't matter. They enact states of feeling, but they don't anchor them to a day or a time or an individual or a moment, but they are profoundly recognizable. So that a really great sonnet like, they that have power to hurt and will do none, who do not do the thing they most do show, who moving others are themselves as stone, unmoved, cold, and to temptation slow. They rightly do inherit heaven's graces and husband nature's riches from expense. They are the lords and owners of their faces, others but stewards of their excellence. God knows what that sonnet actually refers to in the sense of what made him write that. But if you're talking about the way people feel when their feelings are being manipulated by other people, when they're being made fools of because of their, the strength of their feeling that makes them so vulnerable, it's there. All of those complicated, tricky feelings are caught up in that profoundly ambiguous sonnet which I learnt when I was 
12, 13, and which occurs to me daily, I suppose, and has done ever since. These are extraordinary charms and incantations to use to help you get a handle on the way you feel about things. What they really are is the development of the language of love. This is how you make love. And you, in fact, make love in language rather than with bits of your body. Love, first learned in a lady's eyes, lives not alone, immured in the brain, but with the motion of all elements, courses as swift as thought in every power, and gives to every power a double power above their functions and their offices. It adds a precious seeing to the eye. A lover's eyes will gaze an eagle blind. A lover's ear will hear the lowest sound. Love's feeling is more soft and sensible than are the tender horns of cockled snails. Love's tongue proves dainty Bacchus gross in taste. For valor is not love a Hercules, still climbing trees in the Hesperides, subtle as Sphinx, as sweet and musical, as bright Apollo's lute strung with his hair. And when love speaks, the voice of all the gods make heaven drowsy with the harmony. This access to poetry that he has, this, this ability to deal directly with the heart, the uh, ability to make, to make uh, it sounds so pretentious, but it happens. I have felt it, and I've been in theatres where it's happened. I've been in screenings of films, not just my own, uh, where it happens with the comedies, where the ability to have the, the spirits, the souls of the audience sing. Tell me. For which of my bad parts did thou first fall in love with me? For them all together. <laughs> which maintain so politic a state of evil oh. that they will not admit any good part to intermingle with them. But for which of my good parts did you first suffer love for me? Uh, suffer love? A good epithet. I do suffer love indeed, for I love thee against my will. In spite of your heart, I think, alas. Poor heart. If you spite it for my sake, I will spite it for yours, for I will never love that which my friend hates. Thou and I are too wise to woo peaceably. He always manages to do, and he does it in, in Much Ado About Nothing, to take us through what it's like to be in love. It's painful, you agonize, you get frustrated, you often hate the object of your love. Uh, you give it up repeatedly, you throw yourself back into it. At the moment at which you've made the most strongest decision to resist it, you suddenly fall all over again. Um, it's mutable the, uh, instantly and extremely. And that, that sort of... Um, tumbling, kaleidoscopic effect, the way in which our emotions are utterly changed by romantic love is, is so beautifully caught. I may chance have some odd quirks and remnants of wit broken on me because I have railed so long against marriage. But does not the appetite alter? A man loves the meat in his youth that he cannot endure in his age. Shall these quips and sentences and paper bullets of the brain or a man from the career of his humor? No! The world must be peopled! There are no happy marriages in Shakespeare because marriage doesn't confer happiness. And I think this is Shakespeare's insight, that you don't marry someone to be happy. You marry someone in order to be married. And you serve that ideal, even at individual cost that one of the things that has to happen is that the wooing situation in which you deify somebody, you imagine that they're full of qualities they cannot possibly have, has to be changed into the partnership situation where you agree that you'll work and suffer side by side until one or other of you is released by death. I think he felt many things and uh... He has realism about, about well, the statistics, as we all know, are not so great. Uh, and I don't think they were as concerned about the divorce rate back in, you know, 1600, but uh, I don't think that had any, anything to do with the, the fact that relationships are difficult and relationships 
that start intensely or romantically are difficult to maintain at that level and he analyzes them throughout all of the all of the plays and and he does place question marks above them Shakespeare's growing skepticism about human relations is sometimes attributed to an unhappy marriage and to the death of his son Hamnet at the age of 11. But Shakespeare's skepticism is also a reflection of the intellectual climate of his age, a time when former certainties about man's place in the universe were being thrown into question. Of all the books that Shakespeare read, the two which influenced him most were the Metamorphoses of the Roman poet Ovid and the essays of the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne. Ovid gave him the idea of everything being in a state of change, the universe being in a state of flux, nothing being stable. Montaigne's essays, which he read about halfway through his career, just as he was turning to write the great tragedies such as Hamlet and King Lear, gave him a sense of scepticism, of all things being questioned. Que sais-je, what do I know, was the great question which Montaigne asked. And in a sense, it's also Hamlet's question, Shakespeare's question. Where be your jibes now? Your songs, your gambles, your flashes of merriment that were wont to set the table on a roar. Not one now to mock your own grinning. Quite chop fallen. Now get you to my lady's chamber. Tell her, let her paint an inch thick. To this favor she must come. Make her laugh at that. But soft. In Hamlet, we see the birth of the modern psyche as it emerges from the medieval world into a world of greater individualism and deeper self-consciousness. What one is seeing is a radical alteration in the way that consciousness is portrayed, in the way that personality is portrayed, it seems to me the greatest of all Shakespearean originalities. It is clearly more manifest in Hamlet, who overhears everything he says, much more than he listens to anybody else speaking, and who changes, therefore, every time he speaks, which is why there is no central passage in the play, which is why Hamlet is so endlessly fascinating a figure for us, which is why we cannot finally encompass Hamlet, and which is also why no two actors, no matter how great they are or how well directed they are, will ever give us the same Hamlet. It's one's sense of one's own self. It's the sense of that dangerous infinite that lies within. It's the sense that you can just fall down inside yourself and never find yourself again because you will keep falling and falling and falling. Which is Hamlet's predicament, but is in some sense the predicament of all of the deep souls in Shakespeare. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew. Or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. He is so brilliantly intelligent, and at the same time, we see the dangers of the racing mind, of over-analysis, of constant monitoring of who we are and what we do. Uh, as he says at one, one, one point, you know, we didn't get this to fuss in us unused. And yet at the same time, it's a very, very dangerous thing um, because we, we think ourselves in and out of situations and, and he does ask the question to be or not to be and right at the end of the play, in answer to us, just a question that he sort of poses for himself, he says, let be. It's very tough to be and, uh, and not be watching yourself being all the time. That fantastically compelling, uh, irritating dimension of, of human behavior is, is very, very much exemplified with, with Hamlet, perhaps the, the truest human being and the greatest play actor in the whole canon. It's the most excellent canopy, the air. Look you, this brave or hanging firmament. This majestic old roof fretted with golden fire. Why, it appeareth nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. What a piece of work is a man. 
how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, pagan of animals. And yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? Man delights not me. No, no women neither. No women neither. die, and go we know not where, to lie in cold obstruction and to rot, this sensible warm motion to become a kneaded clod, and the delighted spirit to bathe in fiery floods, or to reside in thrilling region of thick ribbed ice, to be imprisoned in the viewless winds and blown with restless violence round about the pendant world, or to be worse and worst of those that lawless and in certain thoughts imagine howling. It is too horrible. Shakespeare's world was shadowed by the ever presence of death. The plague was a frequent visitor to London, decimating the population and repeatedly closing down the theatres. Renaissance tragedy is the dramatization of the human encounter with death and Shakespeare's modernity is reflected in his attempt to confront death without the consolations of religion. You get a very bleak period of almost nihilistic uh, philosophy right through, particularly to Troilus and Cressida, and then he seems to me to have died with a rather world-weary brand of humanism fluttering about him. But I have a strong feeling that whatever religion was drummed into him as a child, Catholicism at home, Protestantism at school, ebbed fairly quickly. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Shakespeare died in 1616 when he was just 52. He'd been the most popular player out of his age, but his plays could easily have been consigned to oblivion had they not been preserved in the memory of his fellow actors. hoped that he would be remembered by posterity as a poet. It didn't cross his mind that his plays would be performed beyond his lifetime. And he would be astonished to know that they're still being performed today all over the world, let alone the stat stature that they've achieved over 400 years. It's something that people often forget. I sometimes wonder if Shakespeare really knew how good he was. He wasn't remotely interested in publishing his plays for posterity, but the popularity of the plays meant that from pretty early in Shakespeare's career, editions began to appear, and often they were in highly inaccurate texts. So, for instance, we find Hamlet's famous soliloquy, to be or not to be, I, there's the point, to die, to sleep, is that all? I, all. What seems to have happened there is that an actor who was in the company, not playing Hamlet, was trying to remember the speech and got the basic structure right, but the actual words wrong. Playwriting was still at this time thought to be vulgar, to, to be popular, to be ephemeral. So to produce a, a, an authoritative edition, a bit like an edition of one of the classics, of Mr. William Shakespeare's comedies, tragedies and histories, was an extraordinary mark of esteem. And it was that edition, the so-called First Folio, published in 1623, seven years after Shakespeare's death, that really 
enshrined Shakespeare as a classic author for the first time. Shakespeare's classic status has been redefined by the cultural priorities of each successive generation. He's been seen as an untutored poet of nature and as an apologist for the monarchy. He's been a poet of national identity and a political subversive, precursor of Freud and a modern relativist. The fact that Shakespeare is constantly reinterpreted is a testament to the richness of the work, but the emergence of a cult of Shakespeare since the 18th century has threatened to elevate him to the status of a god and take away his humanity. As traditional religion declined in the 18th and 19th century, the arts, in a sense, took over the role of religion. And if Shakespeare is the greatest creative artist, then Shakespeare becomes God. In 1769, David Garrick had a jubilee at Stratford-upon-Avon, which really marks the birth of the tourist industry in Stratford. And at the Jubilee, Shakespeare was proclaimed to be a god. In the 19th century, Matthew Arnold talked about poetry taking over from religion as being the profoundest place where we discover what it is to be human. And so it was that Shakespeare took over from God and that in every Victorian household, just as on the prototypical desert island, we have not only a Bible, but also Shakespeare. And one senses in the future, it could be Shakespeare that is read even more than the Bible. The effect of Shakespeare upon literature has been overwhelming, and perhaps at times um, has set limits uh, beyond which uh, figures cannot go. It's fascinating that Proust relies upon Shakespeare to the enormous extent that he does, quite overtly. It's fascinating that Beckett's dramas essentially rewrite Shakespeare. Either they rewrite Hamlet, or they rewrite King Lear, or they rewrite an amalgam. It's endlessly fascinating that Pirandello, who is certainly the most original dramatist of the 20th century, essentially takes his stagecraft from Hamlet. Stratford upon Avon today. The town seems at first sight an ordinary, busy country town. In the 20th century, Shakespeare's status as national poet has often obscured the true nature of his genius by turning him into a national treasure. Cars and tradesmen's bands are moving in a world of fragrance, and the very houses seem to set the traveller's heart at rest. Part of the Shakespeare story is to do with heritage. You only have to look at the Stratford tourist industry. The danger of that is that it makes Shakespeare into this rather old-fashioned, cosy, establishment figure. But that's not what Shakespeare's about. Shakespeare uses heritage in his plays, but he does so in order to say vital things to the present. His plays have got to be adapted in order to evolve. That's how he stays alive. Antiquarianism, doublet and hose, would be the death of Shakespeare. The best Shakespeare is always Shakespeare made contemporary. In the late 20th century, the way to do that is through the cinema. And so it seems to me that one of the great achievements of our time is Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet film, which keeps the authentic text, but updates the setting and makes Shakespeare familiar to a whole new generation. both alike in dignity in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. What we were doing was absolutely dis disregarding the accumulation of what I call Club Shakespeare, which kind of dates back to really the Victorian period. We just wanted to get it back to the kind of violent, um, direct, passionate, musical, um, free, energetic, uh, bawdy, um, savage, rambunctious storytelling that it was when this author brought it to the stage. Oh, 
plane. Oh, both your houses. They have made worms meat of me. A plague on both your houses! A lot of people, and I include some critics in this, really perceive great Shakespeare as a sort of distant memory of Victorian Shakespeare. A much, much later interpretation. You know, heavy sets, tights, costumes, and then when you start to get to the turn of the century, beautifully round vowels, you know, but soft one later on with the bricks, you know. I mean, that sound is a new invention. It's a 20th century sound. Nothing to do whatsoever with the Elizabethan stage. He writes on all the levels. Therefore, if you don't get every sophisticated idea, you will get a good, raw, nasty story or a good body moment with the clowns or a great st story of jealousy. And he writes about the emotions that any person from age five upwards can understand. And that's his genius. He has so usurped human nature. And not, I believe, just as an observer, but as a creator as a modifier of human nature that in some deep sense he has taken it over he is he is the only multicultural author oddly enough uh, he is the only universal author our sense of ourselves is engraved there and i do not believe we can get away from it very far even if We've never read Shakespeare, even if we've never seen him uh, performed. To me, in the absence of a sort of conventional religious faith, I'd say that there is much practical, moral, spiritual um, illumination in these plays that, as an individual, distinct from the work I do, is immensely valuable to me. What I think is eternal about them is that he deals with the central institutions of human society. And as long as those institutions survive, then the plays will continue to read our culture. His is as an enduring genius because it is rooted in what hopefully will endure, and that is the human race and how we behave and act and don't act and things of that nature. And of course, it may well be possible that the next millennium will produce another Shakespeare. I'm only be sad I won't be alive to see it. <laughs> as long as the language survives, and I see no reason why it shouldn't, then Shakespeare will be there. He is the language. Like as the waves make towards the pebbled shore, so do our minutes hasten to their end, each changing place with that which goes before. In sequent toil, all forwards do contend. Nativity, once in the main of light, crawls to maturity, wherewith being crowned, crooked eclipses gainst his glory fight. And time that gave doth now his gift confound. Time doth transfix the flourish set on youth, and delves the parallels in beauty's brow, feeds on the rarities of nature's truth, and nothing stands but for his scythe to mow. And yet to times in hope my verse shall stand, praising thy worth despite his cruel hand.